church. Come on, let's stand together. Let's begin our time of worship and remember that we're giving all glory and honor to the one who made a way. His name is Jesus. Yeah. 
church. Give him some praise this morning. Amen, amen. You may be seated. morning, church family. My name is Nathan. I'm one of the ministers here at Creekside. And as we are stepping into the month of March, that means that Easter is just around the corner. So I wanted to get some things in front of you guys so that we can make sure to mark our calendars, make sure we're all on the same page as to what that's going to look like here at Creekside. So we are going to actually have Easter services on two separate days. So on Easter Sunday, we will have our normal 930 and 11 o'clock services. And then actually the day before on Saturday, we are going to have 430 and 6 o'clock services that evening. And what we are kind of saying around here is that we would love for you to attend one and serve one. So that language of attend and serve, we would love for you to choose one of those two days and, and use that as your day to attend service and come and, and be a part of the body and the congregation. And then on whatever that other day is, uh, leave that space open that you can come and help serve as being part of our church family and as part of the congregation, that you can come help serve. As many of us know, Easter is one of the more highly attended uh, church services throughout the year. And it is going to take all of us as a church family to be able to make sure that we can put this on and be together uh, to make sure that St. John's County can know and relate and love Jesus in this way over these two days. So we would love for you to be all in with us. That is something we've been talking about all year at Creekside, being all in together. And we would love for each and every one of you to be all in on that day, serving with us and attending with us and joining in in what that looks like. Uh, one of the things we talk about in student ministry a lot is that there's this beautiful part of Jesus writing his story that every single one of us has a different story. And because of Jesus writing our story so beautifully and all of us having a different story, uh, it also means all of us have a different next step to take. Wherever you are in your walk with Jesus, you all have a different next step to take. And we actually have a next steps area in our lobby. So if you don't know what that looks like for you or what's next for you in your walk with Jesus, our next steps team would love to walk through that with you. And if you're joining us online this morning, thank you so much for worshiping with us in this way. You have a next step to take as well, and you can uh, interact with that next step either through a connect card in our chat feature on the online services or our church website has that as well. And church, as we are about to continue in worship, I invite you to, to create this posture of praise like we just sang about. In all things that we do, we praise you, Lord. So as we continue to worship, Please praise him. Church, let's stand together. Father, you are welcome in this place. We invite your spirit to come and just saturate the room. As we declare these truths to ourselves and one another, Father, would you come and break down walls? Would you inspire us to praise you no, regardless of circumstance because you have never left us or forsaken us? So, Father, come and do what only you can do. And we praise this. Or we pray this in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry? Then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Were the whole earth that going his imminence, his name would burst from sea and sky. From rivers to the mountain tops, we hear Christ be magnified. Come on, church, join with all creation, sing it out, lift him high.
your prayer this morning. Declare it to him. Let it be your truth. I won't bow to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. And if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified. Lift your voice with us and worship, worship him. I love you, Lord. Come on, lift it. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. Thank you. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Of the goodness of God. Why? Because all my life, all my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am in.
Amen. You may be seated. Your goodness is running after me. What an important truth that is, right? Just this last service, we saw a baptism happen, which is such a great uh, explanation of God's goodness continually running after us. And church, uh, we're about to enter into a time of communion. So if you're worshiping online with us this morning, this would be a great time for you to go ahead and prepare the elements. And if you're here on campus with us this morning, and if you miss the communion elements on your way in, you can go ahead and raise your hand and our ushers will bring you uh, the elements. In Luke chapter 15, uh, there's a series of parables where Jesus does a great job of depicting exactly what it looks like for God's goodness to continually chase after us time and time again. You see these three different stories of the way that it shows that God, no matter what is standing in his way, no matter what maybe we have gone through, he is going to continually chase after us. And as we step into this time of communion, I invite you to reflect on that a little bit. That no matter what you've been through or what you've done or, or how much wrong you feel like you've done in your life, that God still wants a relationship with you and he still is going to continue to run after you because he is a good, good father and he loves you oh so much. So as you take communion, remember that. Take a time and remember all that he has done and that he continues to chase you. You can go ahead and take communion. Let's pray. Dear God, just thanks for this day. Thanks for allowing us to be able to enter into a space like this where we can come together as a family and, and know you and love you and worship you, God. Thank you for sections of scripture like Luke chapter 15 where you give us an example of how great that love really is and how you continue to chase us. God, I pray that as we continue into our our, our weeks and the rest of our lives even, Lord, that we would not take for granted the opportunity to have a relationship with you, but rather, God, that we would return the favor and chase you in the same way. God, thank you for your son, Jesus, and sending him and his death on the cross for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
God of impossible. He is able to do it all, is he not? Wow. And that is our prayer, that is our hope, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're dealing with, that you understand there is a real God who loves you. Through his son, Jesus Christ, he's, he's here today, he's wanting, he's pleading with you to have a relationship with him. And he will do what he's famous for, all through scriptures, all through history, so many testimonies of lives transformed and history changed. And he's doing it, friends. He's doing it the more and more that his church turns to him. In the last several weeks, we've seen many, many baptisms happen here, which is awesome. And we've also seen now 56 new people step up and say, we want to join the team. We're going to partner with you, which is fantastic. And we've also seen in Faith Promise already people are, are going out in faith and making bold steps to basically help support the missions uh, both locally and around the world. So it's exciting what Jesus is doing here in us today. And friends, we're starting today a new series, and the series is Unveiling Jesus. And really it's from the book of Revelation where I got that word unveiling. That's what the word really means, revelation really means. I'll explain that in a few minutes. But what we want to do is go through several characters in Scripture who had a certain understanding of God, but then Jesus was unveiled to them. They really encountered Jesus, and it transformed their lives as it can transform your life and my life as well today. Listen, in Revelation chapters 1 through 3, Jesus he warns the church to repent, the church to change its mind. Stephen introduced that word repent last week. Metanoia in the original language means mind changed. You make a U-turn in the way that you were thinking. And he warns them to repent, not for their absence in challenging Rome, the government at that time. This is very key that we understand this first if we want to make a difference in our society. But in Romans 1 through 3, he challenges seven churches for tolerating stuff in their own church. For not really seeing him, not knowing him, not taking opportunities for him, not staying faithful in service to him. And friends, Revelation shows us that he is famous for unveiling himself, and he will ultimately do it in the end. I would highly encourage you to see the movie, Jesus Revolution. Jesus Revolution, true story of Chuck Smith and Greg Laurie and their conversions and the, the great revival that hit our land in the late 60s and early 70s, a revival that we so need today. But friends, it starts with us. It starts in the church. If it doesn't start here, we can't expect it to start out there. And we can't control how the world is, but since we've encountered Christ, we who call ourselves Christians, we can respond as if we've been changed and we've been transformed by the risen Christ. And John is this main guy we want to look at today. We're going to look at others again in the next weeks ahead. But we're going to look a little bit at his brother James to show what really meeting Jesus does to change us and to save us. Have you met Jesus? If you haven't, I would challenge you to read the book of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Revelation, and any more. You can just Google that and pull that up. Even if you can't find it in the Bible, you don't have anybody to show you how to do that. I would also encourage us Christians to go back and seek through reading those scriptures from John. What is the gospel to me, Lord? Unveil yourself to me. Let that be our prayer. In this series, we want to examine the reactions people had to the risen Lord and the blindness that was removed, the expectations that were wrong, the disappointments that were resolved or at least addressed with truth. We want to look at how Jesus was unveiled to people like you and me. And in the process, I think we're going to be able to identify with many of these early followers, their frustrations, their enlightenment, and the resultant convictions. And I hope that you might begin to evaluate whether You've encountered Christ. For real, have you? There's no better person to begin with than John. Revelation means unveiling apocalypsis in the original Greek. Apocalypse. 
And already some of you, these movies are flashing through your mind. You know, Hollywood has taken that word. And there are various things through the book of Revelation they've tried to describe it. But really, it is not that terrifying of a word. It never was meant to be. Apocalypsis simply means an unveiling, like pulling the curtain back as to future events that are certain to happen. A laying bare of manifestation and appearance of what's going to happen. And my prayer is that real Messiah will come to us during this time. My hope is that we will have new and deeper encounters with him, that we will see him more and better in our lives. When we see it in the Bible, uh, we'll begin to look at the ways that he appeared to his disciples and changed them. We'll start looking for that in our lives as well. It might surprise you, friends, but sometimes, my first point through John's life, that sometimes, sometimes you encounter rebuke instead of reward when you meet Jesus. Did you know that? Have you experienced that? I have. Two brothers, they work together at the same job of fishing. These two guys, James and John, Father Zebedee. If you watch the Chosen App series, they pretty much got the dynamic right. Their mother was Salome, and she had hired servants as a result of being rich and wealthy so she could leave those servants to take care of business at home while she also traveled with her two sons in support of Jesus' ministry, and she supported it financially, of course. And, and there's nothing wrong with being a rich family. But these two boys obviously were spoiled, evidenced by how they acted. When they didn't get their way, man, they threw tantrums. And so Jesus called them sons of thunder in Mark 3, 17. An example of their storming reaction was in Luke chapter 9, verse 51 through 56. Jesus sent James and John on ahead. Rather than go around Samaria, which is what most Jews did, he decided to go right through Samaria because he had a point to make. All people matter to God. And he had a specific woman he wanted to meet there as well. And people that he wanted to restore there in Samaria. And so John and James, they go on ahead and they... Uh, come to what would be the equivalent of a Sumerian Hampton Inn today. And they get there, and they go to the front desk, and they basically say, do you have a room? We need a room. Jesus, uh, a very important prophet of God's coming, and we have 11 disciples with us. We need many rooms. Man, you're going to make out. And the guy says, I'm sorry, the inn's full. You can't, you can't come. They're like, what? There were only three donkeys out there, and there's nobody in the swimming pool. What are you talking about the inn's full? And they were infuriated, infuriated. So they go back to Jesus, and in bitterness, verse 54 of chapter 9 says, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, baby? That's what they wanted. They wanted a Cat 5 tornado to sweep through Samaria with thunder and lightning, wipe it clean, their wives, their husbands, their children, everything. And then we'll go stay in Samaria. I love that. (laughs) But Jesus reveals this different side of him that they had probably never seen before. He rebukes them, it says. He said to them, you don't know what kind of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. As we might want to think of that more before boiling over too. Any of you struggle with boiling over? Can we be honest before God? How do you handle rejection and mistreatment? Do you entrust God, his wheels of justice that roll slowly, but ever so finely? Do you really believe the scripture? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And by the way, have you ever noticed that God doesn't usually get vengeance the way you would say? In fact, he doesn't get vengeance. He just tries to make people right. He just tries to transform their hearts. How do you handle it when when things come your way that make you very upset because people aren't treating you the way you think that they need to treat you? Do you take matters into your own hands? How do you handle it when your husband comes home late or, or doesn't get the things that you thought he would get, that he was supposed to get? He just completely forgot. How could he forget? It's only five miles from work to home. How could he forget that way? How do you handle it when your wife, you feel she's been irresponsible and not honored your wishes? An unveiled Jesus 
in a marriage relationship looks like a Jesus who is Lord of our emotions, sitting on the seat of our hearts as king with all of our emotions under control. You want a better marriage? When your emotions are under control, both of you are under control, Jesus doesn't fight with Jesus. He's not going to get up from his throne in this heart and get up from his throne in this heart and go, okay, let's go at it. How do you stop that cycle from happening? One of you has got to be more like Jesus. One of you has got to get more mature and be more loving. And Jesus might just be rebuking all of us a little bit today saying, come on, dial it down. A little bit of James and John and all of us, and if you've encountered the real Jesus, rebuke is a welcome guest. It leads to life. And when the real Jesus is unveiled to you as well, second thing is sometimes you encounter a surprise challenge instead of expectations that you're manipulating. There's also this story in Matthew 20, 20 through 28, where Salome Mom, she goes to Jesus, making a bold request to Jesus on behalf of her sons. Let my son sit on the right and left hand of your kingdom when you come. Now, she's thinking naturally of Jesus conquering Rome. He can do all these miracles. Surely he's going to get rid of these blasted Romans. He's the promised Messiah, and they thought of him as a king at that time. Surely James and John were still thinking of him that way. And what better way to get their way, these spoiled two kids is to go to their mom because she's likely the sister of Jesus mother you think you wow that's a lot of influence I'll get the sister to influence and say go right boldly to Jesus and say make my sons the right and the left after all we're also supporting you financially in your ministry why wouldn't Jesus say yes and when the other 12 when the other 10 learned of this they were indignant they were incensed right and Jesus goes on to make a lesson to them. Of course, he washes feet. And he makes it very clear that greatness doesn't come by grabbing glory at the expense of others. He said, we're to be different than the world. And if you want to become great, you must become servant of others and spend time and energy elevating others. And by the way, you want to improve your marriage relationship or any other relationship? Look for ways, little and big, to serve. Don't try to manipulate to get your needs met, to get your desires met. Look for little ways to serve and watch how the relationship comes back to life. Do you have an ego? Do you have a demanding spirit? This passage directly confronts that in all of us. It challenges us. Here's a very encouraging thing. If you identify even a little with these guys, it's very encouraging to me that Jesus spent most of his time with who? John and James and Peter also mixed in there, right? Why did he do that? Well, I think because Jesus wants us all to know he's not embarrassed by our demanding spirits, our immaturity. He's not embarrassed to have us part of his team. No, he, he will want to spend more time with us, actually, to help us change our character. But we've got to want it, too, just like James and John. We got to want to spend that time that he so desperately wants to spend with us. Matthew 20, 22 says, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm able to drink? And the challenge was, really, and we know this from what happened later, but they didn't know it. Are you able to suffer to the point that I'm going to suffer? Are you able to go even to death itself for me and my kingdom? And, of course, they did. James did. He was the first martyr in the New Testament, lost his head to the cause. John would suffer much through persecutions. But Jesus' challenges, sometimes to us, is that expectations that you have for the kingdom are deferred for a later time. The things that you're hoping for, the things that you're expecting, are not coming now because they are going to be in the future. James and John would be rewarded with those places next to him someday in eternity. So stay faithful. Stay on fire for him. We encourage you to be involved in this Bless Every Home app. Love God and love others. This Bless Every Home app just encourages you to be praying for them and then finding the opportunities to be 
opportunities will come if we look for them, if we take Jesus at his challenge and are we're willing to sacrifice our comforts and suffer with him, even the potential of ridicule for him or canceled or other things that our culture is doing. And sometimes when you encounter Jesus, you encounter insight into true love instead of hypothetical love, the real kind of love that Jesus has. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You really see God moving in and around you when you incline your heart and your attitude in a purer way. John becomes from a son of thunder to a son of love. He constantly refers to himself this way in the book of John, as well as 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. They're all about love. And even the book of Revelation is truly about love. But God loved them so much, he didn't want to see any church removed from the lampstand. He didn't want to see anybody to not be able to experience chapters 19, 20, and 21 the new kingdom, the new heaven, the new earth. I, I asked myself as I was thinking about this, when, when did John really change? In my opinion, it's just my opinion, John 13, Jesus washes feet. That's a very clear confrontation to him. He's really still thinking about it. And then they're having supper together and they're thinking about that. And then Jesus, because he loves John, he reveals to John and a couple of the others who's going to dip their bread in him is the one that's going to be the betrayer. And John watches Judas dip the bread the same time Jesus does. And all of a sudden I think, the bells start going off, the aha moments, the, the defensiveness, all this expectation for Jesus that he thought was love and real life. Suddenly he sees and realizes, wait a minute, Jesus didn't just wash my feet. He washed Judas's feet also, the betrayer's feet. Jesus' love is abundant and radical. And I believe it was in that moment that John became the disciple of love. A disciple transformed and changed completely. Why else later on in the story would Jesus look down from the cross and entrust John to his mother? John's love created boldness. That's what love does. You know, in any movie, in anything, love always has this boldness to just stay close to a person. And John stays close, even though all the other disciples had fled. And this certainly wasn't the thun of, son of thunder that Jesus had previously referred to, right? Who would leave their mother in charge of a son of thunder? No, this is a child of God, a son of love. That's the transforming power. Here's our bottom line today. The bottom line, I believe, of John's Gospels as well as any Gospel. Everybody's welcome, friends. And nobody's perfect. We all have this immaturity. God accepts us in our maturity. Aren't you thankful for that? He's not embarrassed about you and being part of his team. He wants you part of his team. Nobody's perfect. So isn't it time for us to remove our masks? And anything is possible with Jesus. Do what you're famous for, Lord. You're famous for the impossible. And I'm going to cling to that. I'm going to believe in that. I'm never going to back down from that. Because Jesus has been unveiled to me as he wants to be to you. It was John who wrote, if somebody says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And if you want Jesus unveiled in all of his richness, and the question really is, are you leaving enough room for his love and for his insight into your life? Are you allowing the insight to come into you by opening yourself up, inviting him in, even to say, search me, O oh God, know my heart, see if there's a trying way in me. And sometimes when his scalpel goes in in those moments, it hurts. The confrontation hurts, but it's all for our good and out of love. And he gives us insight 
That's why he says in Revelation, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person. And they with me, have you experienced that with Jesus where there was sweet fellowship, where you knew he was just dealing with you in the details of life or through the words of another loving Christian or through a spouse or through a child, suddenly the Lord is getting your attention and he says, I want to dine with you in this experience. I want to be with you in it. Invite me in. Open your heart to the insights that I have. God wants all falseness, all false views of him, all falsehood to be dispelled. He is not our sugar daddy God. He is not an angry God either. And he is not a manipulable God. In other words, he's not Your rabbit's foot. The cross that you wear is not your assurance that everything's going to go well for you. The truth is, God wants you to be like his son Jesus Christ. And if his son Jesus suffered, you might have to suffer as well. All for his glory, though. All for his kingdom. You must put your heart in the right position to be able to fellowship with him. To be able to have him walking with you through the fire and bringing dry bones in your life to life, you've got to invite him in and his insight. Incline your heart to him. Fourth, sometimes the encounter with Jesus just makes you an overcomer instead of folding to the pressures in life. That's what Revelation is really mainly about. His immediate closest disciples, Polycarp, this is John's disciples, Polycarp and Ignatius, that so many of us refer back to in some of their writings to really have it sure with John and what he was saying. Do you know Polycarp was burned at the stake and he was speared for his faith in Jesus? Ignatius was thrown to lions and torn apart and devoured by them for Christ. But they were overcomers and rewarded for their faithfulness. Why had they done that? They had seen the power of John's transformation. They had seen the power of his ability to make it through suffering. And they were determined to do it as well. They tried to boil John to death, by the way. Wonderful, wonderful ways of punishing people these Romans had. (laughs) Tried to boil him to death. He survived somehow. So they say, we're going to exile you to Patmos. We're just going to make you lonely. But it was there in his loneliness that Jesus appeared to him and he wrote Revelation. John led the way for others. When the future that they might have expected fell apart, they didn't. How are you doing with that? When the future that you expected, when suddenly you go, this is not where I wanted to be at age 40. This is not where I wanted to be at age 45. Does you fall apart? Does your whole world fall apart? Or instead, do you stay together as an overcomer for Jesus Christ? Do you march forward as a warrior that he's made you to be? (laughs) He stepped forward in Revelation 1 to show you, hey, follow me. I have the keys to death in Hades. You're going to be an overcomer. Stay with me. I have the keys. The evil one doesn't have the keys anymore. The key shows ownership. He locks a door. It's power in your life. Jesus' revelation, his unveiling, he's the one whose words must not be ignored, the one who has the power to lay us bare and expose our hearts. He wants us faithful overcomers in suffering. Only he knows what's best for us, and we have to trust his judgment because he knows what's best for us and also what's best for others and what they're seeing in us, what's best for his glory, how he's going to lead more into glory. The everlasting. Not too many years ago, Catherine Arnold Wolf was 26 years old. Her testimony was heard in January by many of our college students who went up to the Passion Conference in Atlanta. She was a young mom, an actress, and a model. She suffered a near fatal stroke at 26 years old. And in an instant, she went from healthy, beautiful young woman with a promising future to blind in one eye deaf in an ear, unable to walk, and for a season, unable to speak. Her husband, Jay, stood by her side through all the pain and devastation. And when she regained her ability to talk, they began sharing their story in churches all over the country. A few years ago, they wrote a book, Hope Helps, 
Because Jesus, as the word of God, had transformed them and helped them to be overcomers. Catherine spoke from a wheelchair at this passion conference, and uh, they posted some of her quotes on Facebook. These are the words of a mature Christian, an overcomer. Catherine said, may you see your life as both a good story and a hard story that God is writing. May you open your hands to release old dreams and receive new ones from Christ. May you accept the stunning capacity you have to endure because of Jesus who endured for you. And my favorite of her quotes, may you live out the hardest part of your life with a joyful rebellion against the darkness. A joyful rebellion against the darkness. Friends, that's the life of John and Polycarp and Ignatius and anybody who would follow after Jesus Christ. A joyful rebellion against the darkness. They did not give in to despair when the bottom dropped out in the world. How did they do it? Because Jesus Christ was real to them. My last point today. Have you uncovered the joyful rebellion against the darkness because of Jesus alive in you? Here's what it looks like. My wife's aunt in Tennessee had an older couple friends, very close friends of them. They were in a torrential rain headed to church because they were just those type of Christians, you know. They were there during the week often to clean the church. They were there to help feed the poor. They were retired, but they were on their way to church in torrential rain. And do you remember about five, six years ago, those rains that flooded Nashville, just a basically mudslide came down through a gully and swept their car and swept them into eternity, friends. That's a life, believe it or not, in joyful rebellion against the darkness. Now stay with me here because I want your life to be full and for you to know the rewards and the life that's there. Maybe, let me do a little compare and contrast here. Maybe you recognize the name David Cassidy. Maybe not. Just picture Justin Bieber and Bell Top Bottoms and basically you got it. In the 1970s, he's a big deal. His role as Keith Partridge in the hit TV series, The Partridge Family, and had catapulted him into fame and fortune. He was adored here as well as in the, the, the Great Britain. And he sold out arenas. His music rose to the top of the charts. He had it all. And his party lifestyle, sexual indulgence, and alcohol abuse led to his downfall, early downfall and. 2017, his daughter said David Cassidy's last words were, so much wasted time. Now today, friends, this month, leading up to Easter is a chance to, to make sure that our life is not wasted, that daily Jesus is being unveiled to us. What does that look like? John Piper gives us insight. If you want your life to count, if you want the ripple effect of the pebbles you drop to become waves that reach the end of the earth and roll on for centuries and into eternity, you must, you just have to know a few great, majestic, unchanging, obvious, simple, glorious things and be set on fire by them. The simplest, most glorious thing is just let love and faithfulness to Jesus never leave you. Tie it around your neck. Make it a part of you. Cling to him. Man, do whatever you can to serve him to the end. Be an overcomer. And then he told the story, told the story about a very faithful couple, much like I was telling you the story about my aunt's friends and, and what, what they did. And then he told another story about a couple who was able to retire in their mid-50s and go down to Florida. And man, it was, they talked about their amazing life. They had a swing on the back porch that overlooked the golf. And they had a wonderful time of playing golf together every day. And they got their games down to almost scratch golfers because they could play so much. And then she collected, she had this marvelous seashell collection, you know. And a new boat, and a new life. And here's, here's what John Piper and what I say about that, that life. Especially when you retire from church is a tragedy. The former couple is a great victory, overcomers. But that life I just described, and John Piper says people today are spending billions of dollars to persuade you to embrace that tragic dream. And we would plead with you, don't buy it. 
with all my heart, John says, I plead with you. John Piper says, don't buy that dream, the American dream, the nice house, the nice car, a nice job, a nice family, a nice restaurant uh, uh, to retire with. It's wonderful food and collecting shells is the last chapter before you stand before the creator of the universe to give an account of what you did. And imagine that. Imagine having that life and standing before the creator and saying, here it is, Lord, my shell collection. And my golf game's at 85, and I can I have an ma- amazing boat, and, and my golf swing's so incredible. Imagine standing before the creator of the universe who died for you and rose for you. But some of us will die in the service of Christ. And friends, that's not a tragedy. Treasuring things in the church and in the kingdom above the world, that's a victory. But treasuring things of the world above Christ, that's a tragedy. Do you understand? That's why John said in John chapter 2, man, don't love the world and the things of the world more than, more than God. If, if you love the things of this world more than God the Father, then the love of the Father is not in you. And some of you wonder why Jesus has never Come and dined with you, as Revelation 3 talks about. Relationship with Jesus is a glorious thing. That fire inside of our bones against the darkness, that joyful fire. Get to know him so that you might experience that. Understand, apocalypse, revelation, unveiling, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to Christians. Really, that's the book of Revelation, what it's about. Because why? It begins with us. If the world's going to change, it begins with us. And we may, may, must stay in this attitude of heart that's constantly looking for his return, looking for that wedding night, wanting that relationship constantly, embracing him with this joyful reverence of embrace on fire for him, producing fruits in keeping with repentance. That's what you do when you give your life to Jesus. You give your life to him, you surrender, you're baptized into him. You say, I'm not loving the world anymore. I'm just loving you, Jesus. I'm going to walk in your footsteps. And I'm just, I'm just living in joyful rebellion against the darkness. Because your return is sure. It's coming soon. And friends, we need a praying church. We need a studying church, a reading church. I encourage you to be in John. And first, second, and third John in Revelation. We need a Jesus revolution today. Don't just look at your TV and say, oh, how horrible it is. Look at you. Look inside of, I'm looking inside of me. Where do I need to change so that a difference can be made? A Jesus revolution could happen again, but it begins with us in prayer. You remember that Monday night? that everybody was watching Cincinnati Bengals and the Bills were playing each other and DeMar Hamlin tackled Tay uh, Higgins and Hamlin stood up after the tackle, fell down. 65,000 fans in the stadium and millions watching on TV were horrified as Hamlin literally died on the field and CPR had to be administrated. It was later determined that he had a cardiac arrest. He had it again on the way to the hospital. He was revived again. Fortunately, today, he's still alive. He's doing well, but he's not playing football yet. Several teammates, though, say that their life was transformed by that and what happened. I pray that it really has been transformed. That they don't just leave it and walk away and say, oh, there is a God. But they let Jesus Christ really be unveiled to them and transform them. Form them. Why? We need people like that sportscaster that was bold, was afraid, unafraid of being canceled on culture and prayed on TV, on ESPN, and prayed for healing, and prayed for, to God with reverence. We need more of that. It begins in the church. For a brief moment there, God was making it crystal clear that sports is not the main thing. As believers in Jesus Christ, we know that even physical health and physical life are not the main thing. Jesus unveiled to us in all of his glory on a daily basis, rich and real, 
And our joyful hearts is the main thing. Everyone is welcome. Nobody's perfect. And all things are possible with Jesus today. Friends, will you drop your mask? Will you realize that we're all in desperate need of a Savior? And will you let him be unveiled to you today? Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you, hearts broken, because we realize we're not all that we were meant to be. Each and every one of us needs to give you glory more and more. We need that joyful rebellion against the darkness inside of us, wanting to transform a broken and dying world who will go to hell without you if we don't open our eyes and gain insight into all that you've given us and all that you want us to give to others. Father, we pray today that those who hear your voice would not harden their hearts as they did in the rebellion, but they would soften it and they would come to your throne. Come even now to the altar. Come before you today, surrendering, submitting their life to you. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. During this song, I'm going to ask us all to stand up, make it a prayer to the Lord. If our prayer counselors will come forward now, if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ or you need somebody to pray over you, will you come as we sing? my friends yeah he has been good and he has been faithful to you and it is our prayer that you know going out of here today that he is walking with you and he is beside you church i hope you know how much he loves you we love you have an incredible week we'll see you next time